Hi, this is Mike from We Build Stuff. This video is part of a series of build logs following the construction of a bar top arcade that uses a 28 inch screen. Follow along for the steps I used and see the process I take when building. Rather than skipping over parts of the build, I will be showing almost every single step. Like, subscribe to show support for this channel. All right, today I'm starting a custom build for a new arcade. This one's gonna feature a 28 inch widescreen Somebody's asked me to make one, so I've had to modify the plans that you normally find on my page. Here, this one's going to be slightly taller, a little bit longer this way. And each of the main pieces, instead of being 55 centimeters wide, they're going to be about 70. We'll see. I may change some things as I go. So since I don't have a full-size printout, I wrote this up in AutoCAD and have added all the different angles that I'm going to need to do at my protractor and I'm going to draw everything on. These pieces they're pretty much the exact same as my other ones but I've made some changes just to the actual uh, dimensions. A couple here and there and I will make those available with the link in the description. Uh, the, the screen is going to have an opening that's going to be 61 by 34 and hiding behind it will be all the blocks that hold it in place. It's just a TV screen. I don't have a fancy radius. Uh, yes. I'm gonna use a ruler. Just wait till I kind of get it to where I like it. Yes. Um, let's see. That looks about right. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That was it. Thank you. That's a nice art. Okay. So I've drawn out my basic shapes here. The arc, I had to make do with kind of eyeballing it. I think it did an okay job with that. Just by bending something flexible, it doesn't have to be a ruler, it can be a thin piece of wood, something that is able to hold that shape, and then I'm able to trace a pretty smooth arc. I'm gonna go ahead and nail these two pieces together and cut them both out at the same time so that I don't have to redraw this twice. After that is finished, I will add on all my dimensions to figure out where are my blocks going, again, according to these plans. Where are all these pieces going to go? If you look over at this set of plans, that would be these lines here. That's where all of those pieces are going within. I may have to remeasure things as sometimes there's a bit of human error involved, but as long as they fit each other, everything should be awesome. All right, so I have drawn all my initial spots, for placement, where my blocks, my control panel, all of my stuff is going to go. I didn't have any kind of full size template, but I did use here, I just used a big ruler, protractor and another block of half inch MDF to trace out my width. Half inch MDF works pretty good. So by nailing the two pieces together, it's gonna to enable me to have two exact pieces when they're all cut out. You can use a jigsaw, a bandsaw, a scroll saw, anything that'll work. Just see, use what you got. Go nice and slow with a jigsaw and you can get perfectly straight lines with minimal sanding required. What you're seeing here has probably been sped up by about four times.
one of the main reasons I'm using a jigsaw for this is to show people that you can do this with any tool. My last video I used a bandsaw for this and all my big stuff. I tried to use smaller tools for this build, specifically to show people that you don't need a massive shop to do it. I'm lucky enough to be a high school shop teacher. I run an engineering and arcade building club, and that's where I get to do all this stuff with my students. Get a piece of wood, grab some sandpaper, wrap them together, and start sanding. Get everything smooth now, it'll make your life easier later. I still have them nailed together, so there's still going to be a mirror image. I took it to the big belt sander just to make it quicker, but you could still do this by hand. Now for ripping my panel pieces, I'm going to be using a circular saw, and I'll be using a table saw. I'm going to demonstrate here that you can do it with a circular saw, you just want to take it slow. I'm setting up a very simple saw guide here, just out of another piece of MDF. Set it to the width of your tool. You should be able to get nice straight cuts. Here I'm laying out some other spots just to make sure that I do have enough material. I've put it onto a crosscut sled on a table saw, and I'm cutting out some of the larger pieces. I can also do this with the small pieces as well. You can do this all with the circular saw or jigsaw, it just takes you a little bit longer. I can remove my nails now and begin layout on the other side panel. I want them to be a mirror image and both physically cut out as well as where I'm going to be adding all my dimensions and lines. I'm going based on my plans and measuring from the other panel that I drew. There's always going to be a little bit of human error but if I can cut that down I'll do my best. I'm using a piece of half inch MDF to lay out these lines because that's what the thing's going to be made out of. Might as well trace it rather than trying to draw that out with a ruler. When I was designing this, I wrote down all these little handy measurements in my AutoCAD file. That makes it way easier to figure out where these things are supposed to go. I always want to take my time when I'm laying things out, make it as best I can, it will make my life easier later, and give a nicer look to the entire build. I don't want anything wobbling when it's all done and sitting on a table. Next step I'm going to be doing is routing out a slot for the T-molding. Here you see a piece that is going to be my control panel. There will be a piece of T-molding on the front of this. Now off to routering the side panels. Take it nice and slow. This thing is spinning really fast. I'm wearing a dust mask to keep this stuff out of my face. I try my best to wear these at all times when working with MDF.
If you're not sure what T-Molding is, don't worry. You'll see me install it in an upcoming video in this series. Here I am also ruddering out the bottom piece. This will have another piece of T-Molding on it as well. This piece is for the top panel. I have a nice angle cut, but that's optional. You can hide that behind other stuff if you don't have the opportunity to put an angle on it. So I'm just using regular 2x4 that I got from Home Depot to create the supports for my cabinet. I cut out about 4 feet total. I'm going to be cutting these up into 3 quarter by 3 quarter inch strips. They'll be square. You could use 1 inch if you want a little bit extra support, but so far I found that doing 3 quarters has been enough. Once you have all your strips cut out, it's time to size them to fit your arcade cabinet. I usually buy my adhesive at Home Depot, but sometimes you have to go to the grocery store. Really, I recommend wood glue. Don't use mustard. You could use screws for this entire build. I'm choosing to use brad nails and glue. There really isn't a huge difference, as long as you attach it correctly. Take your time to make sure that your blocks are all lined up nice and straight along with your layout lines. Clean up your glue before it dries so you don't have to scrape it off. Again, this is just the way that I choose to do my builds. There are many different ways to attach your cabinet pieces together. You could do the entire thing without blocking if you wanted to. I forgot to press record when I attached the bottom piece, but I attached it the exact same as I did this top panel right here. In order to help keep it square while the glue is drying, I like to put a couple of my other panels in just as placeholders until it is able to dry up at 90 degrees or square. I'll usually let it dry for at least an hour before I move on to doing any more pieces. While I'm waiting for that to dry, I'm going to lay out some of my other stuff, in this case the upper marquee where my artwork will be shown. I'm measuring a 3 quarter inch border around the whole thing. I'm going to cut that out with a jigsaw or whatever tool I have. If you wanted to get fancy, you could use a router for this whole thing, but I'm going to be doing this project with mostly simple tools for at least most of the steps. So I use a jigsaw, I can use a circular saw, I can use a table saw. The important thing is you take your time, make your line straight, cut it out, make it look good.
I like to try and cut oversize a little bit, gives me some room to sand things down when I'm using a jigsaw compared to a table saw, the cuts may not be as perfect. So get that sanding block out or a file and make it nice and smooth. This is just a test fit. Underneath you'll see where I'm going to be putting my speakers. Next it's time to lay out my control panel. I got a couple angles I need to cut here and I could be using a table saw for that. You could just cut it shorter and not have any angle and nobody would really see it unless you have gaps in between your pieces. I usually do a little test rip and then I uh, go back and finish it off. Good enough for me. All right, next is the control panel. You can see on the left where I routed it out for my T-molding. I want to make sure I don't put the angle on the wrong side. Now the reason that I do this angle is because when I put my screen marquee, it is going to match and sit flush together. You don't have to do this, that's just the way that I designed it. When I'm drilling holes for T-nuts, I'm going to be using a 3 16 inch drill bit and a quarter inch. You'll see why in just a minute. I'm laying out these holes so that when I do have my bolts in, they're going to line up in the middle of where I put my blocking. So I'm doing 3 8 from the edge. So first my 3 16 inch hole. Get my T-nut ready, make sure it fits. And here's for the lower or front control panel. Exact same measurements. 3 8 inch from the edge. And I'll be drilling the holes where I think I want them to go. As long as they are even, that's all you need. So I use the 3 16 bit going through it kind of as a guide to make a little dent or a small hole. Then I'm going to switch over to a quarter inch because that's the diameter of the T-nut. Then I'm going to hammer in the T-nut from the back side. And when the bolt goes through the pieces and into the T-nut, it should hold it in place nicely. This is where sometimes you might want to use a harder wood than pine. Now that washer is not going to be the set of a finish, this is just to test my fit. I'll do that for the other control panel. Same steps, switch my bits, drill out the holes. I try to use my fingers to start them together. Uh, if you go straight with the drill, you run a chance of cross-threading. So take it slow, make it work. Next you see me gluing some little blocks in here to hold the T-nuts in place. I've had a problem where sometimes the T-nuts fall out the back. So if I put a little piece of wood in there just covering the edge of the T-nut, kind of like a little bit closer to it, it should work and hold it in place. Again, this is just the way that I do it. I came up with this and it seems to work pretty good. Nobody's going to see it from the outside anyways. Alright, let's try it with the control panel. I made the, uh, the length of the control panel just a couple millimeters less than the actual width that I want. Make it easier to take the panel on and off. It'll be maybe a millimeter on each edge. Next is the back door. I'm going to be cutting that big back piece into three pieces. The top is probably going to have some holes cut in it for some airflow. The actual back door will eventually have two big holes cut in it for some fans. And the bottom will have the hinge and the electrical. What I should have done was actually cut my electrical holes before gluing this permanently in. That was an afterthought on my There's different ways to hang a hinge. This is the way that I do it. You could stick it in there so that you can't see the hinge at all, but this is way easier. And since it's behind the cabinet, no one's going to see it. 
I always try to drill a pilot hole before using a screw. Makes the screw go in easier and less chance of splitting the wood. I could have used slightly shorter screws. They poke through a little bit, but I'm not too worried about that. Next, it's time to move on to how I'm going to attach the monitor. Some people just use plexiglass, put the monitor behind it, held up uh, by the visa mount holes. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to create this big marquee to hold my whole thing together. I just like the way it's, uh, it looks. I think it's pretty solid, and I think it's pretty easy to do. So I'm taking this big piece. I'm going to lay out where the opening of the screen is going to be. It should be able to hide the bezel and the monitor or screen itself. I'll be cutting this out with either a jigsaw, a circular saw, or a table saw. In my case, I'm going to start with the table saw and then finish it with the jigsaw. I learned this trick a few years ago. I've never had any issues with safety for it, but you should still be careful if you're doing this by yourself. Not a bad idea to have a spotter. Finish it up with the jigsaw, and then I'll file it smooth. For an extra touch, you could take a chamfer bit with a router, run it around the inside to get a nice beveled edge on the inside of this hole. I do that in a later build that you can see coming up in a couple months. This is kind of a raw way to do it. I just put the screen underneath, grabbed my pencil, and traced out the shape for where I'm going to be putting my supports. So using the router, I'm going to route out some slots for the TV to fit into. I don't have to do this at all if I don't want to, but this just gives it a nice touch, and this is my personal preference. With that first little slot eyeballed, I'm using that as a gauge to figure out how far away my router needs to be from my router guide. This is just any piece of straight wood that I can run against and get your nice slot that you're going for. I set the depth to about half the thickness of the MDF. It's okay if you cut a little bit wide because that leaves a nice little bit of wiggle room for the TV. Doing the same thing to the other side, to the top, and then I'm going to be doing a custom piece for the bottom. Go nice and slow so that you have full control over what you're doing. So for the bottom, I just traced out the bottom of the TV onto a little piece of scrap. I'm going to cut that out on a bandsaw. You could use a jigsaw or any tool you have if you're going to choose this method. It doesn't have to be perfect. Again, I like to have a little bit of wiggle room. I can use spacers or just make sure it's clamped in place nicely. After I've got my main spot here, I'm just going to get rid of the excess. Just eyeballed it. Again, if you're using MDF, make sure you're wearing some sort of dust protection to keep this stuff out of your lungs. Fits nicely. Next thing on the back is I'm going to be doing my custom clamping system that has worked for me a few times. This involves doing a couple of these nice strips here, making some slots for my T-nuts to go behind, and then I'm going to create some wood blocks that are going to hold everything together. Again, this is just the way I do it. Make sure you're using glue that is going to be strong enough for this. Again, this is my custom mixture. You can get this at most grocery stores. These are my detailed blueprints. I spent hours and hours on those. So just using some, again, 2x4s or whatever blocks you've got, I'm going to be using these to hold the TV in place. Cut them out with whatever tools you need. This bandsaw has seen better days. It doesn't cut perfectly straight, 
It always ends up cutting on a bit of an angle. I think I need to do some fixing up with that. Watch your fingers. Use a push stick when necessary. So now with all these pieces together, this should start to make a little bit of sense as to what I'm doing. This will all be removable so I can take the TV on and off if needed. It will probably never get taken off, but I like to build all of my projects in a way that can be taken apart and have changes or upgrades and stuff like that. I'm going to do a quick test fit to see if I need to make any changes before mounting. This fits nicely so I can move on to the next step. So the next thing I can do is lay out my mounting holes. Again, this is all modular. I can take this whole piece on and off. That's my plan. So I'm going to use T-nuts again to hold it together onto the arcade cabinet. I initially drilled with my smaller drill bit. I think it was the 3 16th. But then I'm actually going to drill them a little bit larger so I have a little bit of wiggle room. It makes it easier to install so it doesn't have to be a perfect fit when I put the bolts on. You've seen this method in the other videos where I drill my holes and then I just use those holes as a guide to drill the next ones bigger. I wonder if I should invest in some smaller hammers to fit in small places. These little blocks, when nailed and glued in, will prevent the T-nuts from accidentally falling out. If there's really any issue with the T-nut in the future, you can just take a chisel and grind or cut them off. need to cut a special angled piece. I have a little visitor circling and watching my every move, so I need to be careful here. You don't have to cut angles on all your stuff. You're not going to see this at the back anyways, but I like to do these nice little finishing touches. Any little gaps that you see will be covered with wood fill. Again, use your custom adhesive to hold things together and nail it in. This piece is the speaker mount under artwork marquee piece thing. Basically these are where the speakers are going to be mounted underneath the artwork marquee. Two holes to hold it together. And what do you think I'm going to use to hold it onto the arcade? Probably T nuts. I'm doing these test fits also with finishing washers on there. That's how it will look when it's all done. The whole thing is really starting to come together now. I'm very happy with the progress of this project. This piece is going to get glued permanently to that last one. They can come on and off together. glue and brad nail that in just for a nice flush fit.
What do you want? To hold my back door shut, I'm going to be using magnets. I picked these up at Home Depot for a couple bucks. They're super simple and easy to use. I like to drill pilot holes anytime I have to use screws to prevent splitting the wood. Your pilot hole should be smaller than the drill that you're using. Using the supplied screws, I'm going to be attaching this metal piece to the back door. I want to make sure that whatever screw I'm using is not longer than the width of the material. Does that make sense? I don't want it sticking out the back. Give him a shake. <laughs> and just beat the devil out of it. Now I'm going to use wood filler to fill in all the little spots that uh, I might want to blend together or fill in the little brad nail holes. This is a little bit time consuming, so I'm going to be skipping most of it. Next up is the button holes and the hole for the joystick to stick out. This paper template I originally used on my very first arcade video and I found that on Instructables and I know it's circulating the internet. Lay out your control panel the way that you want, not necessarily the way that I do it. I always try to do a little center punching before drilling, it just allows me to be a bit more accurate. I'm laying out the spots for the front control panel buttons. That is on a separate piece. Again, that's my design. Not necessarily the way you have to do it. The pilot holes help guide my Forstner bit in when I do my big drill. Again, this is optional, but this is just the way that I do things. It makes it easier for me, and that's the way you should do it. Always work whatever is easiest for you. Handle your joystick super carefully. Or not. Bought these on eBay, and I'm going to be mounting them with four bolts and nylock nuts. Take your time when laying this out so that you don't have crooked joysticks. I'm going to be countersinking these so that the flathead bolt is able to sit flush with the top of the control panel. You shouldn't really feel it when you're playing games. There are many other methods for doing this, but again, I'm just doing it the way that works for me. I'll be countersinking those a little bit more to fine tune their fit but this is fine for now. So before I can paint the cabinet, I need to make sure everything has been smoothed out, uh, all scratches have been filled, and I've sanded everything beautifully. I'm gonna skip most of that. Here I'm drilling a hole to set up a cam lock. That way if I wanted to actually put a lock on the back of the arcade, I can. I start by drilling a larger hole, and then I do the smaller hole for the actual shaft of the cam lock to fit in. For this one, I'm just using spray paint. I'm gonna go through about two to three cans to do this. I'm gonna to try to do a couple coats, and I'm gonna be showing you the entire time of me painting. Fast motion, of course, but I'm not skipping a single spray. Now, you could also use roller paint, or you know, you go buy a gallon of it and then roll it on. That will give you a different texture. Uh, really, the choice is up to you. I thought I'd save a little bit of money from this. This has a paint and primer kind of in one. It works well for wood. It looked great on this cabinet. I didn't have any issues with any of the paint scratching off. After about 20 to 30 minutes, I usually do a second coat, and I think I do a total of three coats here. So before I assemble the actual cabinet with the electronics inside, I want to test it make sure everything works. My plan here with this was actually to take these speakers out of the TV and remount them in the arcade cabinet in a slightly different spot. I didn't really need to do this, but I thought this would be a nice touch. I would probably do it differently in the future, but I'm still going to show you how I did it. So I pulled apart the back of the TV, kept all the little screws in a little baggie so that I wouldn't lose them, 
and I wanted to figure out how hard this was going to actually be to accomplish. It was actually pretty easy, but a little bit time consuming. So I opened it up, it seems pretty simple, the speakers came out very easily. And it's all held in there to a little uh, board with a little snap connector. So I figured if I just cut the wires, spliced in some new ones using some butt connectors, <laughs> and some bullet butt connectors, some wire, I could extend this and stick these speakers anywhere I wanted in the cabinet. So I grabbed my strippers strip the wire and I'm going to be crimping them on. I could also solder the wires, but I wanted to show this way instead. I believe I'm putting on roughly 60 centimeter extension to this so I can stick them in the cabinet underneath the artwork marquee. So by putting the bullet connectors on, I'm able to take the wires on and off from the speakers fairly quickly and easily in case I need to take the arcade apart for maintenance. Fits nice. I'm going to crimp them on there. There's different methods, different tools for this, but this worked. Just make sure to test your crimps so that they're actually attached. So I want to clean up these wires, make them look a little bit nicer. So I'm just going to pull them into straight lines, wrap some electrical tape around it, call it a day. Nobody's really going to see this when it's all done. There, that just cleans it up a little bit. All right, let's plug it back in, test it, and see if the speakers actually still work. Uh-oh. Got a solution for that. I'm going to drill a hole in the back of the TV, pop those wires through, reconnect it, and it shouldn't cause any issues. I'm taping down the wires just in case somebody yanks on it. It's not going to yank the connector out. When this was all done, I only had 30 extra screws. No problem. So, no problem, the speakers work great. Now it's time to figure out the rest. All right, on to the T-Molding. I got this from T-Molding.com. The price is decent. You buy it by the foot with, I believe, a 20-foot minimum. You don't necessarily need these tools to do this, but I found this has worked really well. For going around a corner, you want to cut a little notch out, and that way your T-Molding is able to bend easier. Anytime there's a curve, this is a good idea to do. As I'm doing this, I'm going back over it, looking for bumps or anywhere that I might have missed. I want to make sure it's nice and tight. You can use an X-Acto blade instead of those side cutters if you want. Use whatever you have. Now those aren't chipmunks in the background. Those are my students there for the arcade club at lunchtime. Now normally I don't need to actually write down where my cut is, but I thought that'd be a good visual reminder for the video. In the future I probably wouldn't do such a sharp uh, little turn there. I would keep it a smooth transition. Might cut a little bit nicer. Either way, I think it turned out great. it up as best you can. I set it up so that this cut would be on the bottom and you wouldn't really see it anyways. Flip it over, do the other side. Give it a little flip. Thanks Sean. If you were using artwork for your arcade, you'd probably want to put it on before the T-molding. That way any excess you can just hide underneath it and then cut it off with an X-Acto blade. Now 
This is where I should have used an X-Acto blade. Probably would have got a nicer cut. Now I'm going to be adding T-molding to the control pan as well, as well as the very bottom piece. They're going to be the same length, so I'm actually just going to cut it out here once, measure it, and do that same cut for the bottom. Watch out for any sharp objects, you could cut yourself. Careful with those knives. Alright, let's assemble this, see how it kind of looks. Oh, I love that paint job. I find the green and black were just a really nice color scheme to work with. So, I did a very simple job for these speakers. I think I would have changed it if I did it in the future. I pretty much just added one hole for the sound to come through, and I kind of carved a little funnel in with a chisel so the rest of the speaker wouldn't be vibrating against the panel. In hindsight, this maybe wasn't the best idea, but it worked. It's functional and it sounds really, really good. I like this style of hat buttons. They're easy to swap up micro switches and easy to mount to your control panel. These things basically just snap in and out, so if you break one, you can just pop it out and replace it. I think this is a very simple system, but button choice is really a personal preference. So I personally start by putting all the buttons in first and loosely tightening the nuts that hold it together. For this build you can see that there's just a lone button in the middle. That one is going to act as a hotkey button in recall box that allows me to do certain menu or little shortcuts. Things like exiting the game, uh, saving my states, I can even rewind games. It's all built in there. Very easy to use. That is only connected to the first player. The second player hotkey is going to be hidden inside the cabinet and really is only used for when I'm configuring the controls in the first place. I'm using USB encoders for this build because of their simplicity and ease of use. You plug the wires that come with it into your buttons and your joystick directly into the USB encoder and then a USB cable runs from there into whatever you're plugging it into whether it's a Raspberry Pi, a PC, uh, you could be using it for a small fight stick, anything you want. These things actually will work with some consoles as well as the Raspberry Pi and PC. I'm going to be making a small little map or kind of a plan to figure out where I want to stick all of, the, all of these and I'm going to try to make sure that player one and player two are set up the exact same. Binary solo. Zero, 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 one, zero, zero, zero. Usually these just snap right on. They're pretty simple and easy to use. If you put one on the wrong place, sometimes they can actually be a little bit tricky. If you look carefully at the tab coming out of the micro switch, there's a small hole. That hole lines up with a little tab that kind of grabs it on the end of that uh, quick connector so they're a little bit tricky to get off so make sure you get it right the first time in most kits they will come with maybe one or two extra wires in case but don't count on that with your build you can take the micro switches off the buttons if you choose and just wire them up like that and then snap them in it's really personal preference sometimes it's tricky to get your fingers into those small places Sometimes things come apart. I was lucky enough that I could just pop this one back in. In the past, I've had to rewire and solder things and basically run completely new sets of wires. Uh, I was lucky here I can just snap it back in place and it worked. These things aren't super expensive, hence the build quality. So you can see that I have some basic labels inside. That's just to help me remember. If you wanted to, you could wrap a piece of tape around each wire and label it so that it's easier for you. But I've done so many of these and I really don't need to do that anymore. But if it helps you, do it. Normally, another thing I would probably do is try to find a space where I could, you know, glue down or screw the USB encoder directly to the cabinet. Um, the wires just weren't long enough for this build, so I had to let it float freely. 
but it's not going to be a problem because it's out of the way of anything getting damaged. To hold everything together with my joysticks, I'm using the number 10 by 24 UNC machine bolts and nylock nuts. The nylock nuts have a little plastic retainer inside that helps it stay tight and doesn't loosen, well, too much over time. I wanted it to get nice and flush, so if you remember in a previous video, I countersunk those holes. Just kind of eyeballed it, make it look nice. There's many other ways to do this. This is just the way that I did it for this build. Yeah, those little snap connectors are nice and easy. Just make sure you have your joystick facing the correct way, whether it's up, down, left, right, backwards, forwards, mirrors, just do it the right way. Sometimes you won't know until you plug it into the Raspberry Pi and actually check it, and then you may have to swap wires or flip the thing upside down. The wiring for an arcade is actually really simple if you follow these kind of videos. Uh, if you're doing something like a Pandora box, you may need a JAMA harness uh, or something like that. But really, you just got to find out a way that works. There are so many tutorials online that show you how to do this. This is just the way that I do it. Now, there's a couple ways that you can attach a ball top. If you want, you can use Loctite or Thread Locker. Uh, you put that onto the threads, screw your two pieces together, and they should hold tight. In this case, I'm just quickly uh, tightening it with a locking pliers and tightening it with my, uh, with my hands. I did this just because I wasn't sure if I was going to be making a change later. So now on to a quick test fit. Be careful not to squish your wires when you're putting it all together. This is why sometimes it's a good idea to securely attach your USB encoder directly to maybe your control panel, the underside, things like that. So I'm just doing a quick test. I've put in my finishing washers and screwing in those pieces. Time to attach the screen. Again, be careful not to squish your wires. You'll remember this from the previous video, that was video number three, how I made this little clamping system thing, but it works. This is all made out of scrap pieces of 2x4. Very simple, easy to use, and you can do it with just about any main hand tools at home. You can use a jigsaw or just a manual handsaw, or backsaw I guess you'd call it. If you look carefully at the bottom right of the screen, there was a small hole underneath it. That was to allow a remote control for the TV to access the infrared sensor that is behind it. It's not too obvious, you don't see it that well. Now while I am bolting it in now, I will be cutting the plexiglass cover for it to eventually, uh, but you just don't see that yet. Again, I just want to get it tested make sure that the gameplay is working. So I'm using a Raspberry Pi 3 for this build. Uh, you could use a PC, you could be using an Odroid XU4, there's quite a number of different ways to do this. I chose a Raspberry Pi 3 because at the time this was pretty awesome for the price and it's going to work. These are little plastic standoffs that I'm going to use to mount the Pi to the cabinet. You're going to see that next. There's an IEC power socket, which I'm going to show how to wire. And that switch is going to be used to control the backlighting. And then, of course, a power bar to power everything. So here's a heatsink. Where are you supposed to put it? No. 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 That's much better. And a second one. So I want to put these in here. The supplied plastic screws don't fit, so I need to find a solution. Drill a bigger hole. Just be careful not to destroy your board. Don't drill through your hands. That's a stupid thing. So next I drill a pilot hole before I put the screws into the cabinet. I'm going to make sure I don't go too deep so I don't go through the bottom of the cabinet. So these are just small screws that came with the kit. Plug in my USB encoders and I've left plenty of room to add just about anything. HDMI for the TV. Get everything powered up and we're going to do a quick test. Let's see if it works. Success. So I need a keyboard initially to get set up and navigate through the menu so I can get to the controller settings. First thing it prompts me to do is hold down a button to identify which player I'm going to be configuring. Follow the prompts, press the buttons as needed. Buttons that are not being used, you just hold down any random button until it skips over. Lastly, my hotkey, press OK, and move on to player 2. You can go and configure other inputs afterwards if you want. If you want to assign player 1 or player 2, or switch them back and forth all in the menu. So same deal with player 2, 
Make sure your inputs match player 1 so that let's say your A button doesn't become a B button on the other side. You want them to be a mirror image of each other. The player 2 hotkey is on the inside. Click and save. Let's test some games now. So I'm going to start with just some old classics, some games that only use your joystick and two buttons. Things seem to be working. Let's move on to something that has more buttons. So six buttons, here's Street Fighter 2. Quick Hadoukens, that works. All right, take a break from that. And I'm going to install the speakers because I want to hear the audio. Normally I'd be bolting or screwing down my speakers, but in this case, because of their shape, I'm just going to be putting some hot glue on there. Easy to take off if I need it, but still strong enough to hold it so it does not come apart. I probably would have changed up the way I did this if I was to redo this specific project again. I probably would have got a new glue gun as well. This thing was not the best. So I'll do a quick test fit, and it's on to do some gameplay testing. So this is probably one of my classic favorite games. So I'll just do a quick test here. I'm not a speedrunner, but I do still enjoy and love this game. A little bit tricky to do with a joystick compared to an analog stick, but I always enjoy the challenge of doing that. The first time I ever actually beat this game was probably on an emulator on my MacBook back in college, using just a keyboard. All right, let's test some other games. Again, stuff that I love playing here is just the fighter games. You're going to be using all six buttons for these. So they're each going to get a quick click, test each of the micro switches, make sure I've wired them correctly, nothing is wrong, and then move on to something else. Now, I find the best way to really test these arcades is to let some of the arcade club students or just some of my other students test it out. If it can handle the abuse of teenagers, that means your arcade is probably built well enough. So even though the arcade works, there's still a couple things I want to add to it. One of them is cooling. Because the arcade is pretty much fully enclosed, it needs some way for air to get in and cool down the electronic components that are inside. In this diagram, it gives you some suggestions of how to set it up if you're using a fully enclosed cabinet. I'm going to do something similar to this and just mount them to the back door to allow for air to come in and out and cool down mostly the screen. That's the one that's going to need it the most. The actual Raspberry Pi will need a little bit of cooling, but it's not going to overheat too badly. Now I'll just power. So here I'm just doing some quick math. I got to set it up and cut some round holes in the back of the door. I'm going to be using a jigsaw. Ideally, I should have been using a hole saw for this, but I didn't own one at the time of this build. But this is how to, again, show it with the tools that you have. I was in a bit of a rush. I probably should have gone a little bit slower when cutting so my cuts weren't as smooth as they could be. But it is going to be at the back of the unit. You're not really going to see it. Next up is a hole for an IEC power switch. I probably should have done this before painting, but I forgot. Um, but it fits, nobody's going to be able to tell the difference anyways. This is going to be supplying power to everything. Back to the fans, uh, this is just mounting them. I probably should have used some longer screws to do so, but it works, it's not going to come apart. So these are just wired in via USB and they have a small little power controller to change the speed of the fans. I'm probably just going to leave it on high. Next up, this is showing how to actually wire the IEC power socket or switch, whatever you want to call it. It has a 10 amp fuse, which should be enough to handle just about everything. I'm using 16 gauge wire for this, and I should have used some fully insulated quick connects, but these will do just fine for now. I'm going to wrap them up in electrical tape afterwards, so you're not really going to notice. I used a diagram that I found on Instructables to do this, and I will show a picture of that later. Before you cut your actual power bar, make sure it actually works. Test it out so you're not wasting all your time. Strip those just enough so that you can fit the quick connects over top. I had to do a little trim there. Crimp them on and let's start attaching it to the actual power socket.
Now the first time I went to go and test this, I actually forgot to put the fuse in. It took me a while to figure out what I had done wrong. Alright, pause the video if you need to for this part. So, as I said earlier, I just wrapped some electrical tape to it just to prevent any connections from touching each other that shouldn't. We don't want to short circuit anything. This is good enough, it will work, but ideally you should use fully insulated connectors. A quick trip to Home Depot. These are what I should have used. These are female quick connectors and they're fully insulated but my way will work as well. Okay, time to wire up these LEDs. I have a power brick and I have a switch and I want to put them all together to make them work. First thing is to figure out the polarity, which wires go where, switch them around. I'm not really worried about getting zapped because this is fairly low power. That works perfectly. And even though I tested that connector, I decided to just chop it off and splice it into the wires. That's a little bit easier. I'm gonna connect these together using, again, little quick connectors, crimp them together. This is the way I used to do it when I used to wire car stereos. And the other way to do this is just solder it and wrap it with heat shrink. So for wiring up the switch itself, I just referred to the diagram that came with it. I just have to attach it to the correct tabs that are coming out. Pretty easy, and I'll do that with the female quick connectors as well. Now, I didn't really like these little uh, adapters to attach my LEDs to the wires. They were cheap. I thought they were a good deal when I got them, but clearly I should have spent some more money on it. So I'll just quickly add in my female quick connects to there, and these will slide right into the back of the power switch. Plug in a power brick. There's my diagram. And that's plug them into the right way until they work. Perfect. Oh, wait. Almost. So these are the problem with that little uh, adapter. They are kind of finicky. I find they don't really grip the LED strip as well as I'd like, but they do work once you get them into the right place. Just don't jiggle them around. The adhesive that came with my LED strips was not the greatest. I ended up having to glue gun these in there, uh, but it is inside the cabinet. Nobody's going to see it, and it does function. So I'll have to now, won't I? Here's the one who said it. So the glue gun is not the prettiest, but it's going to be hidden behind everything. Ideally, I'd love to have just, you know, a single bar of lights that would just pop right in without having to do all this work. But for the price, this is just fine. I need to make a hole for the switch for the back of the cabinet. I'm going to be using two different size Forstner bits. You don't have to use Forstners, you could use a spade bit or just have one big one in the back. It's up to you. I'm just going to pop those together nice and quick. It works. Pop on the nut. Tighten it up really awkwardly with these terrible needle nose pliers. Does it work? I see lights flashing. Fantastic. All right, now to actually get this whole thing wired together correctly, I'm going to put the power bar that has been attached to my IEC socket in there. I could use screws, bolts, or in my case, hot glue gun. And I'm going to be using these little cable timeouts to organize all the wires and the mess that's going to be inside here. Now, since I took off the screen, it makes it a lot easier to do all this work. This is why I like to build my stuff modular. I like to be able to take things apart and make changes if I need to. It could probably look nicer and cleaner if I didn't have all these nuts and bolts sticking out everywhere, but this is just my style. Build it to suit your own. Now I know that there are special tools to cut plexiglass or plastic or whatever it is you got. However, I didn't feel like buying them and I just used what I had on hand. I was really careful and slow when using the circular saw and it worked pretty good. You can't really tell a difference. For this project, these again bolt on and off. It's going to line up with the same holes that are on that front screen piece. Maybe for another project, I'd like to actually have it slide in uh, and not be permanently attached like that. That way you can take it in and out, easy to clean. But for this project, I was under a bit of a time crunch and I did make it work. I also cut a piece for the artwork marquee as well. 
and just hot glue gun that in, it holds it in place pretty nicely and I know it's going to work just fine. I will be changing this up for a future project, but it works. So yeah, extra fuses. I didn't have any of those when I first wired this up, so I think I had to wait two days and did some shopping to go get it. Definitely cheaper to buy them online than at a store. All right, let's see if it works. The light has turned on. The system has booted up. Fantastic. The lights, I may not always want to have them on and off, so that's why the switch is in there. You don't always be, want to be blinded. So here's a quick look inside the working cabinet. I've got all my power. I have the Raspberry Pi 3 with the USB encoders plugged in as well as the cooling fan and onto some artwork. I designed it in Photoshop just with some quick images and borrowed a printer to print them on. This only cost me about $10 to print the banner. Nice full color and I'm quite happy with that. So, dun, dun, dun. To hold this in temporarily I'm just going to be using tape. Uh, probably not the best way but I was planning on switching out the banner later so I wasn't too worried about a permanent solution. I should have used clear tape instead of the masking tape. The masking tape ended up creating a bit of a shadow from the LEDs behind it. So let's do a quick test fit and see how it all looks together. I really like this color scheme with the black and green. I think that looks really nice. So I thought I needed some more lights so I pulled off another basically two layers and I'm going to attach those to the part that holds the speakers. I'm going to add some bullet connectors in there so I can take it apart and put it back together. Again, I like to do things modular. And this worked well for me. Again, the adhesive didn't stick very well, so I needed to use the hot glue gun to hold it onto my piece. Give it a little white before reapplying the artwork and it should work. So this one I use clear tape. As far as I know it's never come off. Reattach the speakers, get them working. I put my DIY labels on there and they pretty much worked. Reattach the lighting, put the bolts in and permanently attach everything together. I think this was the last time that I actually took it apart. So this project is pretty much done. I really enjoyed working on this. This was a fun way to start and actually you make a design completely from scratch. I based some of the shape off my previous builds, but it works. I'm happy with it. I really like playing on the larger screen. You can fit two people way more comfortably beside each other to play multiplayer games like this. <laughs> I do wish that I'd made the control panel a little bit deeper so that I could fit all the buttons on the top, but for the most part, I think it still looks very clean. So let's take a look at the inside of the cabinet. So player one hotkey, that matches here, and the player two hotkey, if you remember from the previous videos, is on the inside of the cabinet because I only use it for configuration. That's just the way Recalbox works. So there's a little switch for the LED lighting. There's a switch for all the power. That's an IEC C14 if you're hunting for those on Amazon or eBay or wherever. I'm using intake and exhaust fans to cool and circulate the air through the unit. It has a little speed controller from, I think there's three speed settings. My power bar with only three things plugged in. There should be power going to the lights, to the Raspberry Pi, and to the TV screen. And the speakers are powered directly from the screen itself. So Raspberry Pi 3, not too bad. I moved on to using an Odroid XU4 for another build, but this still plays just about any retro game you could need. Speakers are up there and hidden, easy to access, and my next arcade project video will be a full-size cabinet. I've already built it, I just need to edit the videos, so please stay tuned for that. Thank you again for watching these videos. Uh, they were a lot of fun to edit and actually make the whole project itself. I'm happy that it's finally done. I will probably make a couple videos in the future for how to actually program the Raspberry Pi or Odroid or whatever you're using. It's extremely easy. Check out Recallbox. Anyways, the plan links are in the description. Please send me messages, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Bye.